Hello, everyone. Uh, so today's speaker is Alan Chan from uh, uh, Princeton uh, University. He's uh, going to be talking about uh, nicotine type uh, spherical maximal functions. And the floor is yours. Thank you, George. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Uh, so, before we start, I think it's <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we should start. <laughs> I made co host everybody here. So, I muted everybody and gave the introduction. Yeah, okay. So, I'll be talking about negative type spherical maximal functions. Uh, and this is all joint work with George Osiris and John Chan Kim. Um, so, I guess I should start by explaining what these words mean in my title. Uh, so, I'll start with nicotine set. But before I do that, um, so nicotine set is a kind of maybe like a pathological set. And there are many kinds of these. So, I will start with some that might be more well known. So, the first kind is a Pesakovic set. So, a Pesakovic set um, is, a, is a set in the plane of measure zero that has a unit line segment in every direction. So you have a line segment in every direction, but the union of these line segments has measure zero. So here I say as a theorem. There exists a set A of measure zero that has a unit line segment in every direction. Okay. So another kind of set similar to this that exists, but for circles, is what's called the Vesikovich Rado Kidney set. So this is a set which has a circle of every radius. So for every radius, there's some circle of that radius, and then the union of all these circles has measure zero. So, so now I'll talk about nicotine sets. These are a little bit harder to describe. So, so this is number three here. Um, the idea is that there's a line segment. So this, now the set A has the property that there's a line segment through every point, but it can't contain this entire line segment L Y, um, because if it had the entire line segment L, if A contains this entire line segment um, L Y, Y itself is inside L Y, and this is supposed to be true for every point in R two which means that A is all of R2, it can't have measure zero. So instead of having um, Ly being inside A, we have almost all of Ly inside A. That's what this statement here is saying. You're allowed to remove a set of um, H1 measure zero, or, or of a length zero from Ly, and the rest is inside A. Actually, if you look at um, like standard descriptions of nicotine sets, you can say more. You can actually say that Ly minus the point Y itself is inside A. Uh, so you have a punctured line segment through every point. But we, we won't need this, um, yeah, but this is true. Uh, OK, so now I can talk about the, the kind of set that's the most relevant for the talk today, which is nicotine sets for unit circles. Um, and so this is, you have now a point, for every point y, you can find a unit circle passing through y, and with the property that almost all of the circle is inside the set A. And so for every point, you have some circle. And then for each of these circles, you can take a, a full measure subset of it that is inside A. Uh, yeah, so like I said, so you actually don't need to know about these first three kinds of sets for this talk. Really, it's, the talk will focus on this fourth kind of set here. And this was something that um, I constructed with Mariana Chornier when we studied the Kikea, Kikea needle problem for rectifiable sets. OK, so, so these are the kinds of sets we work with. And now I'll talk about maximal functions, because that's also in my title. So yeah, we have the nicotine sets. Uh, so for each of these kinds of uh, four sets up here, there's some kind of associated uh, maximal function to it. Um, so I guess like yeah, here I've written it uh, in full generality. But let me just go through a few examples. So for basic COVID sets, so these were the sets that had a unit line segment in every direction. The corresponding maximal operator does the following. So you have a function f from r2 to r, and you have some delta greater than zero. Um, and you, have, you fix a direction e. So let's say e is a direction in S1. So e is a direction. So in other words, uh, a, vector, a unit vector. Um, then you can define m delta f e to be the following. Uh, so you, you so let's say you use this direction here, point like this. Then you can you can consider all uh, rectangles 
of uh, dimensions one by delta um, in the direction e. Right? So this you have it here's a rectangle, here's another rectangle. You, you can translate this around R2, you get lots of different rectangles in the same um, direction. So let's uh, give these rectangles a name. So the center here is x. I guess let's call this rectangle a lot of parameters. P delta e x, I guess. Um, right, so this is the, the rectangle of dimensions one by delta oriented in direction e centered at x. Um, and now this maximal operator is uh, kind of like this. And so you, you fix the direction E, and you consider translates of this rectangle all throughout R2. And then you find the one that uh, maximizes the average of F. And this is known as the Cartier maximal operator. Okay. Uh, yeah, but like I said, we don't actually need to focus on these three kinds of sets here. So I'll skip two and three and just go straight to the, the corresponding maximal operator for a Nicodemus sets for even circles. Um, so here you can see the ideas will be kind of similar. So for Bestakovic sets, um, the thing was you had a unified segment in every direction. Now we have a circle, unicircle through every point. So, so our setup is now, we have things like this, F and delta. But now instead of a direction E, we have a point in R2 and an m delta f um, y will be the supremum of, so you can, here's the point y, you consider all circles passing through y, and then you take the delta neighborhoods, it's like all unit circles passing through y. So supremum c is a unit circle containing y. And then you take the average of f over the delta neighborhood of this unit circle. So C delta means the, the delta neighborhood. So you're taking this these circles by delta. Um, and this is the, the Nicodemian maximal operator for unit circles. Uh, and the idea is that because of the sets that existed in the previous um, page here, it turns out that these operators, if you look at what happens as delta goes to zero, if uh, the LP norms of these operators are go to infinity. That's what this says here. Um, so you cannot hope for a bound that's uniform in delta uh, for, for these operators. Are there any questions up to here? Okay. Yeah, so we'll study this, these kinds of operators in this talk. Uh, and so the, the first thing we know about these operators, this operator m delta, is that um, is this property here. And this follows from the previous page. Yeah. Also, so I've stated everything uh, in just in R2, but, uh, but this, uh, these kind of sets exist in higher dimensions as well. Uh, you can just repeat the construction uh, here. And, uh, and then what you get is that you have a unit sphere passing through every point um, in Rn. And uh, almost all of the sphere is inside your set A, and A has uh, the big measure zero in Rn. And so you can have the corresponding spherical Nicodemian maximal operator, which also has this property here. So, so with that as our starting point, we can ask some questions about these operators. Right? So here I just repeated the definition of this operator, but now I've stated it in higher dimensions. Um, so one question you can ask is, so we know that if we let delta go to zero, right, the operator norm of this has to go to infinity uh, for all p less than infinity. Uh, but we can ask, um, how quickly does it go to infinity? We find some quantitative rate as delta goes to zero. So in other words, let's find some exponent alpha such that a statement like this is true. And the larger alpha is, it's saying that uh, we have a worse bound, like the quicker it goes to zero, essentially. It goes to infinity. Whereas, um, oh, and then yeah, I have this uh, less than tilde tilde notation to hide the like, extra epsilon factors. So like, things like logarithmic factors, um, yeah, we don't care about. So this is one question you can ask, like quantify how quickly this thing goes to infinity. Another question you can ask is, what if we modify this operator here? Um, can we modify it in such a way that um, we actually do get boundedness uniformly in delta for some p? 
And by modify, I mean things like uh, here we take the supremum over all unit spheres passing through X. But we can, instead of considering all spheres through X, let's consider a subset of those spheres. Um, sorry, a subset of the family of spheres passing through X. Okay, so we still, sorry, let me draw a picture. So in, in two dimensions, we have all these circles passing through this fixed point. But let's say that we don't allow, um, you're not allowed to choose all, any of these circles. There's some restricted set of circles that you're allowed to choose. So with that kind of condition, can we get something like this? And the answer turns out to be yes. Um, and the right thing to look at is the, um, the upper Minkowski dimension of the set of circles. So I'll say more about that uh, when we get there. Okay, so, so this was um, taking a, a smaller, a supremum over a smaller a set of things. Okay, so then the operator behaves nicely. You can also ask the opposite question. What if you take supremum over more things? And so we have a worse operator. What can we say about this? Uh, so, so in this third question here, instead of looking at just unit circles through a point, I can look at uh, circles of different radii. And what can I say about this? And so one thing that I find interesting about these three questions is uh, that the techniques that we use to answer these or to study these questions, um, they're quite different for, for these three types of questions. Uh, so for the first one, it's mostly that we use uh, geometric techniques. I think questions about intersections of spheres or of annuli. For the second one, the techniques we use are mostly Fourier analytic. It will use um, the, Fourier trans the decay of the Fourier transform of the spherical measure, um, a certainty principle, uh, little with Haley decompositions. And then for the third one, we have some geometric estimates, but then we need to combine them with some incidence uh, geometry. Um, because it turns out that intersections of spheres of different radii are more complicated than intersections of spheres of unit radii. Yeah, so these are the questions that I'll talk about uh, during this talk. And so now I'll go through each of these. Yeah, so for, let's start with the first question. So it's finding some quantitative um, radii, which uh, this, this uh, thing goes to infinity as delta goes to zero. And uh, here's the Here's the theorem that we have. Um, and so, so I repeated the question up here. And, uh, and here are the bounds that we have. So in two dimensions, we have an L1 bound, L2 bound, and an L infinity bound. It turns out that the uh, L1 bound and L infinity bounds are quite straightforward. So I won't say more about this. Um, the interesting one here is the L2 bound. Um, right, so this, so as, as we know, this thing has to go to infinity. Right, so here I have less than tilde, tilde one. Because the like the it's a blow up to infinity is not a power of delta. It's like some logarithmic term. Um, so this is for all dimensions two and above, and it turns out that for three dimensions we have an extra bound which is at L three halves. So then this here this gives us um, something like delta to the minus one six <coughs> for the L three halves bound. Um, and so I've only stated it for these uh, values of p, but why didn't I state it for the other ones? It turns out that at least in, you, you can interpolate these bounds to get other values of p. And in two and three dimensions, the bounds that we have here are actually sharp for all values of p. So in other words, once you prove, um, let's, so let's say in two dimensions, you prove once you have these three bounds and you interpolate um, for the remaining values of p, then you actually get the sharp um, like exponents alpha for all p. And the same is true in, in three dimensions. And you take these four bounds and you interpolate, you get the sharp ones. So the, one particular consequence is um, there's different behavior at, uh, between one and p equals one and two for two dimensions and three and above. Because at two dimensions, uh, if we interpolate the L1 and L2 bounds that we have, we get delta to the minus one third for p equals three halves. Right? And so this theorem down here is saying that this is sharp. Uh, but uh, for dimensions three and higher, we have a better bound, which is delta to the minus one sixth. And so I say that these are sharp for two and three dimensions, and we don't know about four dimensions. So we have all these bounds in four dimensions and higher, but it turns out that there's some like, different behavior that occurs um, in dimensions four and higher. Um, and so, so the lower bounds we have don't match um, these upper bounds. And so I'll say a little bit more about that, about how like, all dimensions two, three, and four and above are all different in some ways. Uh, so I'll, I'll start now by talking about this L2 bound. So I said that L1 and L infinity are relatively straightforward. So, the, so 
And we'll talk about the outer bound. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the previous page, I had less than tilde tilde one. Okay. So here I have a more precise statement. As delta goes to zero, this thing blows up okay, as uh, logarithmically. So log one over delta to the one half. Um, and if you're familiar with the Kakea maximal operator, this looks a lot like Cordoba's um, bound, like L2 bound for the Kakea maximal operator. But by it looks a lot like it, I mean, it looks exactly the same. Like they have, there, there's the exact same expression. Um, and in fact, the proof it, you can prove it in very similar ways as the Kakea maximal operator L2 bound. The idea is to take our operator and discretize it and then use duality of LP spaces. So I've stated a kind of technical lemma here, which um, if you study the maximal operators, like this will look familiar. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you can reduce this question of getting an LP bound on um, this operator by, by something here. Yeah, so I, I would not recommend reading this lemma, uh, even though I wrote it here. Um, like, uh, but I guess let me just point out some features of what this says. So this says that um, it's enough. So instead of considering so m delta, F. So this is a function of x where x is in R2. Instead of considering you know, all x in R2, right, we can consider some delta separated subset of points in, sorry, we can consider some delta separated subset of points, like this grid here. Okay, so these will be the xi's. And um, so here in this original definition, you wanted a sphere passing through each, uh, each x. Right? But yeah, let's just consider this discretized version. And now we have a single sphere, a sphere passing through each of these xi's. So we have finitely many spheres in this case. Um, and yeah, you can reduce this question here to a question about expressions like this, um, where you don't get to, so you have some ex, uh, coefficients ai satisfying some property, and you have um, some, yeah, you have these spheres si passing through xi. So you don't get to choose these coefficients ai or these spheres. Um, SI. But the idea is that if you can bound it, if you can get a bound on this expression here independently of these choice of AIs and SIs, then you get a bound on our operator. Uh, so I guess the idea of the proof of this theorem, like why, let me see why you can discretize. So the idea is, uh, by a picture. So let's say you have a point X here. You have this point X here. Um, and you want to approximate X by a nearby point XI. And then, um, then if I have this sphere passing through x, I can find a similar sphere passing through xi. And now if I take, let's say that these, let's say xi and x are within delta of each other. And then if I take a delta neighborhood of these two spheres, they're almost the same thing. So I guess, uh, you know, if I take a delta neighborhood of x of the sphere passing through x, and this picture is going to be an s. This delta neighborhood of the sphere passing through x. And then I take a two delta neighborhood of the sphere passing through xi. So this orange region is supposed to contain a green region. Um, oh, that's kind of convincing. Right, so the spheres that are close to, enough to each other, you take a, you know, a neighborhood of one, it'll contain the other. That's what this picture is saying. So that's, a, that's what allowed you to discretize, uh, or like that's the geometric reason for this. And then, so you can reduce this um, like LP estimate. And you have LP number on this thing. You can reduce it to a sum of over finally many points and then use duality of LP to get LP prime. So I guess that, so I, um, I think uh, I won't say anything more about this. It's kind of technical. Um, yeah, but for P equals two, we, we're interested in P equals two. So here we have L2 norm, we have L2. So then here we have, um, yeah, the dual of two is still L2. Um, so we're interested in expressions like this, L2 norm, the things like this. Um, and, so now let me talk about this in the next page. Yeah, so let, let's not ignore the coefficient AI just for simplicity. And let's get an idea of what kind of geometric things we need to study to understand expressions like this. Okay, so this was the thing on the previous page. Yeah, this thing here is now here, but I just decided to ignore the AIs for simplicity. So if we write out what this is, we can expand this out. Yeah. Um, and it becomes exactly the sum over pairwise intersections of um, of these spheres. By the way, sorry, I didn't explain this notation. And this is the indicator function of the sphere. So, so here I have the sum of indicator functions of these SIs, okay, where the SIs are these spheres passing through these points here that we don't get to choose. 
Um, yeah, but if you have uh, something like this, there's L2 norm squared, and you expand out the sum, then you get this sum of pairwise intersections. Um, so, yeah, so the question is uh, let's say you fix, so let's, let's say you have a sphere, you have a point xi, you have this corresponding sphere si, and you have a delta neighborhood of that. And then you have another point xj. And you have a sphere passing through xj, let's call it sj. Okay, so, so now the question is, what is the intersection of the delta neighborhoods of these two spheres that I drew? And in this picture here, uh, it's pretty simple. These two spheres intersect, the delta neighborhoods will intersect here and here. Okay. And um, each of these has area like delta squared. Or volume, I guess, in general. So I've drawn this picture in two dimensions, uh, but this is true in high dimensions as well. Let's say in three dimensions, you have two spheres, like they'll intersect in a circle. And if you take the delta neighborhood of a circle in R3, because it's co-dimension two, it'll have area like delta squared. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a typical kind of intersection. I guess then you need to be a little bit careful about um, spheres that are kind of close to each other like this. When you take their delta neighborhoods, then you can have volume larger than delta squared. But this is handled the same way that um, you handle the Kikia maximal operator. Um, so yeah, so for those of you who have seen that, like the Kikia maximal operator before, the, the picture there is usually you have these one by delta rectangles. If they intersect transversely like this, the area is like delta squared. But then if they intersect kind of like this, then the area can be larger. And uh, it's these kinds of um, slightly larger uh, contributions that lead to this log term here. Um, so I guess I won't go into more detail about this. Um, but, uh, are there any questions about any of this? Oh, and I guess so. One remark I made here is: uh, so if you have seen these kinds of arguments before for like other circular maximal functions, um, so in for example the kind that Wolf studies. Uh, you have situations where you look at intersections of spheres like this. And so now if you take the delta neighborhood of, uh, of this, you don't just get you know, this delta ball or delta circle. You get something that's more like delta by delta to the one half because of this tangency. And so this is a larger intersection. But because we're working with unit circles, things like this can't happen. But this will come up again when we talk about the varying uh, radii case, which was the like question three in, in my list earlier. Yeah, so, so this gives you how, an idea of how to put the L2 bound. And now we can try to do the same thing for the L3 halves bound. Yes, yes, so this one we talked about. Now I'll talk about this one here. So for the L3 halves bound, we can use the same um, technical lemma here. We can reapply it to P equals three halves. And in that case, P prime will be three, which is very convenient for us because instead of, instead of an L2 norm here, we have an L3 norm, which we can still expand. So that's what's written over here. And we can expand it and get a question about um, intersections of three spheres. Uh, but it turns out that intersections of three spheres is more complicated than two spheres. Well, I guess maybe that's not surprising, but let me tell you um, one thing that can happen, which, so, er, so here I said that, that we didn't have to worry about things being tangent. Everything, you can, uh, we didn't have to worry about situations like this. But there, there are similar kinds of issues that happen when you look at unit spheres and uh, intersections of three of them. Uh, so the idea is, uh, so first let me convince you that uh, if we have three unit spheres in R3, so this, this picture only makes sense in dimensions uh, three and higher, right? Because if I have three unit circles in R2, most likely they won't have a common intersection. So imagine these are three uh, circles in R, the three spheres in R3, so they come out of the, the page or the screen or whatever you're looking at. Um, uh, so the thing that's relevant, one quantity that's relevant is the circumradius of the um, triangle that, uh, so, so you, you have the three centers of the three spheres, they form a triangle, and then the circumradius of that triangle is relevant in calculations. So let me try to convince you why. So the circumradius, pictures. So the circumradius is, uh, this quantity R with the property that there exists a point in the plane 
which um, has distance r from all three of these points a, b, c. So now if I draw this again in, in three dimensions, here's a, here's b, and here's c. So, so these are all inside r2, like, you know, this plane here. Um, So this is, the, this is the same picture as uh, above. And I'm looking for some common intersection of these three spheres, these three unit spheres. Um, so if, I, if R is less than one, then I can move above here, so directly above this uh, circumcenter. Right? And then this distance here is one to all of these three points. Right? Because the distance was R, like inside the plane. If R is less than one, then I can move up a little bit, and then the distance will become one. Okay, so this is a point in the intersection of the three spheres. Okay, without the delta neighborhoods, but just the actual three unit spheres. And the same is also true if you move down a little bit. Um, okay. Um, so now if we, so this was for the actual spheres. If we take a delta neighborhood of these spheres, then in most cases, you end up with just a delta neighborhood around these two points here. Um, and because we have intersected three spheres, the dimension, the co-dimension has increased by two. Uh, so from co-dimension one to two to three. Okay, so these each have area or volume like delta cubed. That's the typical case. But the problematic case is when, so this is if R is if bounded away from one. If R is close to one, so I'll write it like this. Then now we have a different picture. But let's say that R is equal to one. Let's just um, make this picture easier. And so now I have A, B, C. And uh, I have this point of distance one away, like from all three of these points here, inside the plane. So in this case, like, this point is in the intersection of all three of these spheres. And if I take a delta neighborhood of um, these three spheres, then now instead of having something that's like a delta ball, it'll actually go up like a delta to the one half. Instead, you can try to picture this. There, like, all the tangent planes are vertical. And so, in some sense, like all, yeah, all the tangent planes, the intersection of the tangent planes of the three spheres at this point here, uh, like they all continue in a vertical direction. So you can go up and down by like some delta to minus one half. So this is delta here, and this direction, the delta to the one half in this direction. So here, the volume is now more like delta to the. What is this? And so, so this is larger. So yeah, so this is a picture in three dimensions. So, um, okay, so now we have a larger um, intersection here, which means that some of these terms might be as big as delta to the five halves, which uh, makes things more difficult. And so then we need to split into a bunch of cases, which I've kind of written out here. The idea is that the shortest side length is relevant, the circumradius is relevant. And um, so a rough idea of how we split into cases. So it's actually more technical than this. But um, like if, if two of the three spheres are very close to each other, so like let's say A and B are close to each other, you might as well identify them as the same sphere and just ignore one of them. So not ignore one of them as in like intersection of three spheres, just it's bounded by intersection of two spheres. Um, and then, yeah, so in the other case, now we look at um, the value of R. And so this is kind of what I explained just now with these pictures. I guess if R is greater than two, and then and all of these, um, there is no common intersection uh, in this picture here. You can't go up and down. Yeah. Any questions about this? And so in some sense, this shows how um, like three dimensions and higher is different from two dimensions, because you have, and when you look at intersections of three spheres, things can get more complicated. And you only need to look at intersections of three spheres for dimension three and higher. Okay, so these are, so, yeah, so I have proof, or I've given a sketch of the proof of all four of these bounds now. Well, I mean, well, the two interesting ones, at least. Um, and now I'll talk about uh, like why these are sharp. So, so this thing here. Um, and so the idea is that for each of these sets, uh, for each of the, um, the bounds that I stated above, that we can find some corresponding lower bound um, of this type, uh, and um, 
And these prove that the bounds above cannot be inferred. Let me give an example. Um, and so the examples will depend on the dimension. So the simplest example is this uh, in two dimensions, uh, the, this like, ball or disk of radius delta um, turns out to be a good lower bound. So what I mean is, so here is my set E, it's just a ball of radius delta. And then now I'm interested in and what values of x make uh, make this thing large? So, so here's the center of E. So if I draw a sphere through the center, a unit sphere, right, and I take the delta neighborhood of this, that's going to be a complicated picture. Okay, so imagine the delta neighborhood of this sphere. Right? It'll contain all of E. Um, so if s is a unit sphere containing the origin, then uh, S delta contains E. And, um, and so this means that M delta one character indicator function of E is large for the points X, which are on this circle, this orange circle that I drew, right? Not the center because our, our maximal function is defined by taking spheres passing through a point, right? So for example, for this point X, I can choose this orange sphere and then um, show that this thing is large. And same with all of these points as well. Um, but now I'm allowed to rotate this sphere. I can, cons I can consider any um, circle passing through this, the origin, which means that, uh, and, and yes, yeah, so if you rotate this orange circle around the origin, um, then you get the following. So oops, if, uh, if x is the inside of the unit ball, then m delta e. You can, for this point x, you can always choose a sphere passing through the origin, so that this kind of statement is true. And then the um, definition of the maximal operator is just, uh, you yeah. have this. Um, but E has area delta squared, and the delta neighborhood of S has area delta, so this is delta, so approximately. Um, so, so then this tells you that M delta when e, you take the LP norm of this and divide it by the LP norm of just the indicator function. Let's see, so what's this? So for the numerator, um, and we have that this function is delta for a set of measure comparable to one. So the numerator is just delta. And for the denominator, we have uh, the, the area of the set E raised to the one over P power. So this is delta squared to the one over P. So this is delta to the one minus two over P. And so this is the lower bound we get um, for all P in two dimensions. Um, and yeah, and if you compare this, this delta to minus, delta to the one minus two over P to, um, to these bounds here, it shows that if you interpolate, um, if you interpolate between p equals one and p equals two, you get exactly what I wrote before at that lower bound. So that's an example that shows that it's sharp in this range here. Uh, also, another thing to notice about, um, about this calculation is if I do this in n dimensions, then, um, then the situation is different because, um, let's see, so E is now has area n delta to the n, S delta still has area and delta to the one, so this is now n minus one. Um, so this whole calculation changes to something like this. And so the bound we get actually depends on n, and this bound is not as good for larger n. Uh, and this is why yeah, we, we have different results for different dimensions. Uh, yeah, and then so for three dimensions, um, to show sharpness and for different values of p, there are two kinds of examples that we look at. Let me just draw a picture of these. And so one of them, is, is this a delta, like delta the one half cylinder, which we kind of saw earlier um, in a different context. Uh, and then, so that's this example. And then for this other example, we have um, this cylindrical shell, which we have a cylinder of radius one, and height delta is the one half, and thickness delta. So if you look at these two examples, then at least give you the sharp bounds for, for the exponent for all p. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe one thing to note here is that yeah, there's different behavior 
in two and three dimensions because in three dimensions, and what we're taking advantage of here is some tangency properties, which if you try to do in two dimensions, it doesn't work as well. Um, yeah, and then so now if we compare this with what happens in four dimensions and higher, it turns out there's yet another kind of example that we can take advantage of, but only starting in four dimensions. Uh, so we can't do this in two and three dimensions. And this is related to the following kind of uh, thing, that, thing that can happen in four dimensions. So, so in four dimensions, I'm drawing uh, two copies of R2, two orthogonal uh, copies of R2 here. And I'm going to put a unit sphere inside each of these R2. And so this point here represents unit sphere. And this point here represents a unit sphere inside the other R2. Except I'm going to rescale them so that they each have radius one over root two. So, yeah, so I guess uh, you can try to imagine them that uh, here are two spheres, uh, sorry, unit circles. You have two unit circles inside each of these complementary and orthogonal copies of R2. And this is the best I can draw. It's kind of a sad picture. So, so maybe this picture here is actually better because um, if I connect any point of the first circle to any point of the second circle, so this diagram is only two points, uh, this distance here is one. And, but you can imagine that this is true for any point you pick on this unit circle and any point you pick on this unit circle. So that's what I've written here. And that um, you have many points, of every pair of points um, in these two sets has distance one from each other. Uh, so I call this a lens type example because uh, I guess that in the, um, air dish unit distance problem literature that is known as the lens construction. It shows that the unit distance problem, which is given endpoints, how many um, pairs of them can have unit distance. This problem is actually trivial in dimensions four and higher because you have something like this. Um, anyway, so in our case, this is an interesting example because if you take something like this in n dimensions where n is greater than four and you do the same kind of calculations that I showed in the previous slide, you actually get a bound at L four thirds. So four thirds is an exponent that has not shown up um, earlier. Um, but you get this kind of lower bound here. Uh, let me, let, maybe I should draw a picture of all the bounds that I, I have mentioned. So, so, um, so let me go back to, to this other page. Ah, here, yeah. And so, so here I have alpha, which is this exponent, and then I have you know, for one over p, which is one over one, is the uh, one over infinity, is one over two, is the uh, one over two thirds, one over three half thirds, three fourths. Okay, so so what are all these bounds telling us? Uh, so in for n equals two, we have. Uh, a very slow decay to infinity. So in other words, alpha equals zero. But then once we pass um, p equals two, um, so at, at one we have delta two minus one. So that's a one here. And then by interpolation we get this line here. So for dimension three, um, what we get for dimensions um, yeah, three and higher, we have better bounds when p is between one and two because uh, one sixth is strictly smaller than one third. Okay. Like this, this point up here is one third. This point down here is one sixth. Um, and now, so I'm playing, so, um, so you can ask what happens in higher dimensions. So we have these down in higher dimensions, but the, the, the idea is that maybe we can do better about maybe do something down here as well. Um, but it turns out that the best we can hope for is to extend this line here slightly more to three fourths and then connect that up here. So in other words, like, this is the best bound we can hope for, is to prove something like this. Uh, and this was given by the, uh, the like this lens type example that I just showed. Um, so, but actually, we don't know if this bound is true or not. So, so I have written it uh, yeah, like this. So the, based on the examples we have, the best bounds we can hope for are these, which is this picture that I just drew. Um, but this one we don't know. Okay, so I guess if you try to do the same kinds of arguments that I showed earlier, like here we have p equals four thirds, the dual is four. And so you need to look at the intersection of four spheres. Um, yeah, but four is greater than three, and three spheres was kind of hard. So I guess this will be more difficult. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so this was um, 
the first topic that I mentioned. Um, okay, so it's, um, yeah, it's mostly geometric arguments to get um, these exponents. Now I'll move on to the next topic. How much time do I have? So it's 25 now. Mm -hmm. Is going to? Whatever. Uh, ten How much time you need? I mean, uh, ten so minutes. It's okay. Ten minutes? Yeah, I, I can finish in ten minutes. Yeah. So can I'll, I make it fifteen? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I'll say a little bit about um about each of the other topics. Later anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have less um planned for the other topics anyways. So. So I think this is fine. Um, yeah, so, so for the, the next topic, the idea is um, instead of, um, so, so what was the operator we were looking at this whole time? Um, so M delta F, and we were looking at unit spheres passing through X. But to specify a unit sphere passing through X, so let's say this is the point X. Okay. That's like taking um, some unit um, vector U and adding it to x. Okay, so x plus u is, a, is the center of a unit sphere passing through x. So I could have written this maximal operator as uh, take all unit vectors u and then look at the average of x plus u plus sn minus one. And this is the unit sphere centered at x plus u. Okay, so this is yeah the same operator that we were looking at earlier. And so now what I was saying about looking at a smaller family of spheres means taking this set Sn minus 1 here and making it smaller. So if T is a subset of Sn minus 1, okay, then we can look at uh, what I've written here. So it's the same, it's the exact same thing as this, except that I've replaced this um, Sn minus 1 with a set T. Uh, and yeah, and it turns out that um, if T has strictly small, so let's let D be the upper Minkowski dimension, of t. And it turns out that um, if d has dimension strictly smaller than the upper Minkowski dimension of the unit sphere, which is m minus 1, then we actually do get some healthy boundedness for this operator uh, for some finite p. Okay, so this operator is a smaller operator, it's, a, it's better behaved, and so we do get some healthy boundedness. Um, yeah, so something like this. So let me say some ideas of how this proof works. Um, but it turns out that for this operator, it's easier, and we don't really need to take this delta neighborhood here in these arguments that follow. Uh, so instead of looking at, uh, yeah, so instead of looking at these delta neighborhoods that we've been looking at the whole time, we can just integrate now um, over surface measure. Um, and then, so instead of proving this result, or let me just Give some ideas on how to show that it's always bounded for p equals two. Right? So two is always uh, greater than uh, this number here. So we always have LP boundedness for p equals two. Let me show some ideas on how that works. So the idea is that um, our operator can be written as a convolution, a supremum over some convolution with a spherical measure. Um, and then so. It's, u and t and x plus u, like this was the same thing that I wrote before. Like you, you take the point x, you translate by unit vector, and you get another sphere passing, you get a sphere passing through x. And then, and then we take this um, spherical measure, we decompose it dynamically in the Fourier space. This is a little of Haley decomposition. And then, so that lets us break up our operator into a bunch of other operators. And then these operators are, are easier to control because of the, this uh, restricted Fourier support. I'm going through this very quickly, so yeah, this is not necessarily supposed to make much sense. Um, I, mean, I just want to give you an idea of how Fourier is used here. So a little bit decomposition. Um, and then, the, yeah, so one way that these kind of operators behave nicely is that because this thing has a like, Fourier support um, inside this ball of radius two to the J, um, this convolution here is roughly constant in some sense on scales of size two to the minus j. This is the uncertainty principle. And so that allows us to discretize the supremum uh, kind of in a similar way as before by looking at just finally many points space by two to the minus j. So that's what's written here. You can, by the uncertainty principle, you can discretize and consider a finite set of points instead of through the supremum over all the points. Um, 
And then how many points do you take? So if you're if you have your set T and you want to approximate it by points that are two to the minus J separated, well, the number of points you need is exactly given by the upper Minkowski dimension. And so that's why that is relevant here. Um, so that's what this down here is saying. Yeah, and then at some point we also do stationary phase. So you, know, you can skip the rest of this. I just wanted to point out that as a, here's how upper Minkowski dimension appears. It's because um, we, we can discretize and uh, we can discretize because of the uncertainty principle, because of this little Paley um, and Fourier localization. Yeah. So there's a bunch of Fourier in this proof. Like it's very like the proof is very different from the previous proof. Right? So, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And then so I'll, now I'll, I'll finish by saying a few words about the last topic. So this is what happens if you consider more spheres, but instead of just considering unit spheres, let's say you consider all spheres of radio. Um, between one and two that pass through a fixed point x. So consider this sphere, this one, and so on. Um, and so not surprisingly, the bounds are worse. Um, but actually, it, so in the unit sphere case, there, there were some um, gaps between our upper and lower bounds, but we actually have, you know, the full range of like, optimal exponents for all dimensions um, when we allow the radii to vary. So in two dimensions, you lose this L3 uh, L2 bound, Instead, the best exponent here, where it doesn't grow like a power of delta, is L3. Um, and for three dimensions and above, uh, you, have, you still have the L2 bound here, but you don't get anything between one and two. Yeah, and so, so this is sharp. These bounds give you the sharp bounds for all P for all dimensions. Um, and, and so if you're familiar with uh, like the wolf circular maximal function, he also gets an L3 bound in, in two dimensions. And it's kind of, it's for a similar reason. So this is like the picture I drew before. If you have um, two circles that intersect uh, like this, so they intersect in the tangent way, then the intersection here can be larger than delta squared. Uh, and this can lead to, to issues. Um, and so we, the idea is we need to control how often this happens. This is what Wolf did. And uh, so we, we can use some version of their result, of Wolf's result. So here I've stated some upper bounds, but I, I don't have time for this, so just move on. But it's the same kind of examples as before. And some kind of delta by delta to the one half tube or rectangle, and then some kind of lens type example. Uh, yeah, so similar kinds of um, examples give you that these things are sharp. But for the upper bound, we actually need some kind of statement about how often. Um, Circles can be tangent to each other. Okay, so, so if we dualize L3, we get L3 halves. Okay, so this is the kind of bound that we're looking for. Again, L3 halves bound on the sum of the indicator functions of the delta neighborhoods of these circles. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, so this is something that Wolf proved um, in his case. And it relied on um, yeah, looking at how often these kinds of tangent intersections can happen. So the idea is that this can't happen too often um, for the following reason. Let's say you have three circles like this. Well, how many circles can you find that are tangent to all three? There's internally tangent, let's say. There's one here, and there's one here. And that's it. Um, and so this means that you can't have all pairs of circles being tangent to all the other ones, unless you have a trivial case like, like this. Um, and so, and so what Wolf showed using um, yeah, incidence geometry is that if you have n circles in R2 that are such that no three are tangent at the same point, um, then the trivial number of pairs of tangent circles is n squared, because right? they're n squared pairs of circles to begin with. But they can't all be tangent to each other. You have an upper bound of n to the three halves plus epsilon um, that can be tangent to each other. Uh, and so if you use some variation or some quantitative version of this, you get some kind of L3 hash down here. Uh, and so Wolf proved this by assuming that with the additional assumption of like the circles have delta separated radii, this is because that's what he needed. But if you go through his proof, uh, it turns out that that assumption is not needed in his proof. But you can remove the proof, move that assumption, replace it with some other assumption, um, and, and the same thing still works. Uh, yeah, so so uh, I guess uh, this is stated more explicitly in some upcoming work by Ramonic, Young, and Zhao, um, where they study similar kinds of incidence questions. And they use different techniques from Wolf, too. 
and to recover this bound for a wider range of curves. Uh, yeah, but so I just wanted to show that these kinds of like, incidence geometry questions do show up when we study um, this third kind of question when the radii are allowed to vary. Yeah, so that's it for my talk. Thank you very much.